Okay, today's little project is this Sony FH7 unit. It's a Mark II. I think this came out around the early to mid 80s era um, before the CD players are really a thing. You could get an optional record player for these little unit that sat on the top. Um, I'd, I've never actually seen one in the flesh, they were pretty rare. But these were a really good little solid unit. Very decent amplifier in them. These square woofered speakers were pretty good. Good sounding units, very reliable. Back in the day though, obviously this is getting quite old now. Uh, the grill's missing off one of the speakers and the, the tweeter here isn't looking so good. Also the tape deck uh, cover's missing and the door's, I'm not sure if it's broken or actually just loose, but something's wrong there. This little auto reverse bit's broken, I think. But um, yeah, so we'd, I basically just bought it as a parts thing just to just have a look at one again. I haven't seen one in a long, long time. Um, didn't really repair many of these back in the day because they're very reliable, um, other than probably changing the lamp on the tuner, the backlight on the LCD. So um, we'll have a look at this and just see what the story is. It is actually a component system, even though it looks like a single shelf unit at the moment. All these pieces do come apart. We've got a tuner, sort of preamp and graphic equaliser, tape deck, and this power and amp unit. Uh, this has the amp chip in it, I think, and power transformer and that sort of thing. Um, these are quite a heavy unit. Um, weigh around probably 10 to 15 kilos with the speaker and everything, so it has a handle on it, but it was more of a shelf system. Um, you can sort of see here how these these are separate actual units. So that's our amp bit with the speakers and the power going into it. Tape deck here. That's our preamp part where you've got a phono input on the back. Then we've got our tuner. Uh, these are all sort of connected in these big ribbon cables as a lot of these Sony systems were. So these all your audio and switching and stuff goes through that. So there's no like RCA outputs of any of the, of the tuner, so you can't really use it as a separate tuner. There probably is a way to do it, but um, it would need a, a, a power rail and yeah, obviously stereo outputs on here somewhere. So you'd have to find all those. So generally not something you can easily separate and use uh, elsewhere. We could probably chuck this, if this tape deck's pretty well at its day, we could probably remove that and throw it away and still run the unit without it. Um, as long as that amp lead comes up and goes into our tuner. I'm not sure what the tuner's, well, that's connected to the preamp, so that must be the, probably the audio signals on this side and the switching and power on the other side. I think the first thing we'll do is actually check the impedance of these speakers and check the amplifier outputs to see if there's any DC and um, we'll go from there and see what the other components actually do. Okay, so we've got our multimeter set to ohms here and we'll get one of these speaker wires and just measure across that. These are probably yeah, down around the 4 ohm mark. What are they rated at? Impedance 6 ohm. Power handling, 38 watts nominal, 76 max, so they're quite powerful little speakers, but that's measuring around 5 ohms, which I think is okay. I'll check the other channel. That's also measuring here, yeah, 4.95 ohms around there. So obviously impedance and resistance aren't exactly the same thing, so at least they're not shorted. So they're probably, you know, they may not sound any good, but... They were, at least they're not shorted out or anything like that. So we'll just check this power cord. These got these old figure eight power cords, single insulation. So it always pays to run your hand down them and run your eye along them. Just check that no one's pets have chewed on them or any other sort of problems happen that's cut through the insulation on these. Because these are quite easy to damage, these old cords. Looks like it goes into the plug okay. So what we'll do is we'll plug that in. And certainly where the power switch is, we've got some lights going. We've even got our tuner light. So power's on. So what we'll do is we'll plug our multimeter, switch it to DC voltage. And we'll connect that to the speaker terminals. And 
And yeah, we've got a very small DC voltage there on the one of the channels, probably the left channel. Go back over to the other channel. Very little there. I think my fluke might be gone into auto range or something. Come on, wake up. But yeah, still, there's, there's very little voltage there, so it's safe to plug the speakers in on this thing. Uh, probably should just make sure our, I think that's our volume, is it? Make sure our volume's down. I'll just turn the power off for the safest thing. And we should have a trace on one of these, not that it really matters about phasing the stereo at the moment. I'll put that to negative. And yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Chop these off and clean them up a bit. White trace to negative. Okay. Let's take a look at the front of these here. Might help if I turn the right thing on. So we've got tuner lights. Ooh, very scratchy. Volume control, which is not surprising. That definitely could do with a clean. Yeah, we've got both channels running. And it sounds like our tuner's probably working. FM. Don't know if I can find a channel. Oh, there's something. It's got a bit of an antenna on it, so there we go. So it looks like the tuner's working and the amplifier's working, as pretty well expected. Peak level meter. Okay, so that all seems to be going. So basically that means our tuner's going. Surprisingly, the light's actually working in this one. A lot of the time that was a common thing for failing. Looks like we've got a couple of shortwave bands and our AM. All seems to be working, so the volume control obviously needs a clean. Well, that seems to be getting a little bit better now that I've used it a bit. Yeah, it's not the best. So we've got phono, tuner, tape. Uh, tape deck's obviously there, but not in the best condition by the look of it. Auto reverse. The head's actually sitting in between. I don't think that's, I don't know if that's settled right back down either. So there should be a switch somewhere on this. Yeah, the, I think that's allowing us. I can hear something running. Yeah, it's probably the belts are probably stuffed in this. Bound to be broken or rotted away with time. I can hear the motor running trying to do something when I press there's a switch in the middle here. I'm not here, yeah, I don't have the door, so I'm not sure what these lights on the edge here do. But I've got one green light there on the tape deck. Don't seem to be getting the reverse. Oh there we go, our forward lights on. It's gone to reverse. Head's not moving. I don't know, I reckon the capstan's probably... No, capstan doesn't seem to be running either, so... If the capstan's not even going, we've definitely got a motor problem with that. Yeah, it's still making a noise. Trying to work out what it's doing. Normally these have like a belt in them that runs off the capstan from the motor to the capstan, then the capstan will run a gear, which will raise the heads up and down and rotate that head. Um, but there, nothing's. I can't feel the capstans running, so I'd, no reels. So I'd say we've probably got major build issues with this one. Not, I think there's a possum. Not even getting the belt counter, the um, tape counter to run, which is down here. That could be jammed. I can see a belt running off the take up reel here. That doesn't seem to be doing anything so at least that belt's not rotted out completely but it's not doing a lot either so now we'll have a play with this actual unit pull it to bits actually this doesn't yeah it doesn't even have a preset on this tuner so it has tuning you can do it fast and slow 
But yeah, I just realised I don't think they're preset button. They're just the band there. So, so it doesn't even have preset tuning on this, which is a bit of a disappointing thing to say the least. It's pretty basic. Um, you'd expect something like a Sony like this to at least have some presets. So you can set all your channels and just press a button to go and see them or go and go to them. But all we've got is tuning up, down, fast and slow. The fast isn't even all that fast, to be honest. I'm not sure if it's any faster. Uh, slightly. Yeah, not exactly a top-of-the-line unit like you'd expect. These were a very expensive unit back in their day. And um, certainly a lot better than most of the stuff out there. Somewhere in between a sort of ghetto blaster and a, and a home hi-fi system, but... I think these were actually better than a lot of the home hi-fi systems in those days. Certainly had quite a bit of power in them. Um, yeah, very loud and good quality sound on them. But yeah, as you can see, very basic and quite an out-of-date unit now. Maybe if you could get a record player for, for it, it would be alright for that. But um, tape decks, pretty much not worth bothering with anymore. And um, yeah, well, radio. It would make a good workshop radio or something, garage radio. But, um, yeah, who really listens to the radio anymore? I don't, but maybe people still do. Um, but, yeah, generally they're quite an obsolete unit now, but certainly a, a very good unit back in its day. So here we have the end of the unit, and we'll remove these screws. So this is like our speaker bracket. And it also holds the unit together, or the units together, as a little, as they are little separate units. Quite large screws here, looks like the old ones they used to have on the old Sony Beta VCRs. So that's one side, as you can see these units are starting to come apart. Looks like, interestingly, all our model and serial numbers are down the side of this unit. Which is not what I expected, but I wasn't really looking at the back taking much notice before, but... Oh, here we go. So... We have an SD78-2 FM Stereo AM Tuner Compact High Density Component System, FH7 Mark II. And our frequency ranges, we have a Sony TA782 Integrated Stereo Amplifier. Compact High Density Component Micro System. Stereo Cassette Deck. High Density Component System, blah blah blah. Power Supply Unit. Now interesting, these all have different serial numbers so it's not like they made a, a set all together by the look of it so we can start separating these things out uh, if we remove these connectors at the back here we have our power unit so I might push these other ones to one side and we'll have a look at that this is pretty much all the weight in the unit I think <laughs> Besides the speakers, which are pretty heavy, this actually probably has five kilos or so in it on its own. Move this top, big flat, I guess it's some sort of C-core transformer or something like that in this. Um, yeah, I can't say I've ever seen one before, but I may have looked at one of these units before. Do I need to take any more screws? No. So four screws, yeah, very impressive looking power transformer there, I'm not sure if how they've actually designed that one. Very hard to even see, it's actually a, I think it is an E-core transformer with the coils going across that way. Certainly very different, which is... Typical Sony, it's got the part number there. Um, we've got two circuit breakers. 
main power switch so it looks like we, our mains comes in through our voltage selector switch up all these wires here into our power switch so now it's got a couple of circuit breakers so I guess it's possible whether they're self-resetting or not I'm not sure and yeah it's possible that our amp, it looks like our amp is in the other unit even though the speaker connections are here because we've just got a couple of large dyes, a couple more they might actually be on the amp outputs maybe not but they, they're another couple of circuit breakers I think they're self-resetting types three bridge rectifiers and obviously some filter caps here 42 volts, 2200 mic 25 so they would be our amp rails so they must be up around the 30 something volt rail they'd be unregulated straight into the amp there's a 25 volt 2200 mic a pair of them so I'm not sure and these two diodes two voltage regulators so there's obviously a plus and minus here's an A770 transistor I think and a C1985 or something 65 I can't really see but anyway so one's a PMP one's an MPN so we'd have a big bridge rectifier that likely feeds our amp plus or minus 35 volts or something maybe a bit higher and two little bridge rectifiers are probably a plus or minus 15 volt or something what have we got minus VCC plus VCC plus VCC H for high maybe speaker left ground something 2 plus 22 volts 2.2 not sure what that says but man that is actually a very heavy transformer there that probably is more than 5 kilos just in this unit yeah it's probably getting all around 7 8 kilos even but basically there's not a lot in there, we've got a headphone socket as well so that's likely our speakers go via the headphone socket, the headphone socket's got a couple of looks like 330 ohm resistors there to drop the level down for that but that's that unit um, other than having a bit of dust in there there's probably not much needs to be done to that um, probably still running pretty well as good as the day it was built uh, these old Sony ca Japanese capacitors and stuff are pretty good and I know some people like to re recap amplifiers but personally I wouldn't touch Japanese ones unless I mean probably here where we live is a bit cooler so they haven't been overly heat stressed normally even if the unit's been used a fair bit but in some hot areas you might want to check them and maybe change them but these old Japanese capacitors are amazingly reliable and I'm basically loath to put in even these modern high temperature caps which most of them aren't particularly good quality certainly in televisions and stuff where they ran hot they didn't last much longer than the originals so yeah they were not a particularly great thing to work on we better unplug our you know, let's just sit in a slot there yeah, we can unplug our tape deck Again, lots of beautiful dust all over that. And we'll have a look inside this unit. And yeah, no doubt we've got some broken belts or certainly some slipping belts. It could be something else wrong with it, but given the age of the unit, it's somewhere around, who knows, 35 years. I don't think the belts will be much good in this if we can even see much in it so I mean what have we got here we've got an auto reverse deck obviously only basic Dolby on off it's got a little LED VU meter here for I guess record level counter so really the the auto reverse is its only sort of fancy feature for back in those days it wasn't a common feature to have auto reverse certainly only the more expensive units had it let's see if we can lift this circuit board up what do we got here some sort of metal cover bias oscillator and we'll have to take the back off this I think 
we should be using a drill to do this rather than a screwdriver speed things up a bit ah, actually undoing that's dropping the circuit board a bit but will it go anywhere? probably not, we might as well take the back off it because, um, yeah, I mean this unit's probably beyond it unless I can get another one with a good door and stuff but you know I don't particularly want to tape deck for one of these because I haven't listened to tape in years so there's our board out of the way, we've got a few chips here I guess probably our Dolby chips, Sony CX174 ooh we've got something living in there I think yeah it's probably just a little moth that's attracted to the light uh, some sort of relay, I forget what I think that was for record playback in Sony's some sort of Alps unit there, I'm not sure CT101 and 201 bias oscillator there's our relay yeah I forget exactly how they did it, I think these other chips also switched between record and play, whoops there goes our aluminium front as well so yeah, due to age, the old double sided tapes well and truly had it on that, so it's just popped off. Now, our actual deck seems to have a capstan built still intact there. And the belts don't actually seem to be too bad, surprisingly. Yeah, very surprising. Capstan seems to be turning everything. At least these units have a few little solenoids in them to operate various stuff. Yeah, that's pretty stiff. Much stiffer than I would think, so it might be dried up grease even. That's probably the one that kicks in the main gear. Yeah, I doubt that solenoid would have been pulling in on its own with that much tension on it. But yeah, not a lot I can actually see on this at the moment. I'd have to remove this other circuit board here, which has got quite a large chip on that one. Maybe that's our record playback area. There's our head connections. There's our heads. Heads come up to here by the look of it, which is up near that relay, so that's more likely doing that sort of thing. Yeah, not a lot to see there. But I might do a separate video on that if we can pull that to bits and well, at least power this up. have to power it up in pieces, so I'll leave that one up in pieces. And we might be able to hook that up to the main unit again and see if we can find out why that's playing up. Yeah, that connector doesn't actually come off here, so I'll unplug our tuner. Now this is our amplifier unit, so it looks like the amplifier is actually in this somewhere, it's not just a preamp. Okay, so here we have the actual amplifier unit. Uh, this is a TA782 amplifier. Uh, TA782, yeah, that's the model number. And so we'll have a look inside this unit. One thing I have just noticed is we've actually got a CD auxiliary input on the front of this one. Uh, actually a 65 millimeter. so even though they, I don't think they ever made a CD player for these units, it was probably a bit early for those, um, or at least for most people to own them. Uh, they did actually put an auxiliary socket or CD auxiliary socket here, because there's only phono on the back, and the rest of it's just through these ribbon cables to the other components. So they obviously had the idea maybe that you could plug your Sony uh, Discman into it or something like that, or Walkman I guess, but uh, more likely you'd be doing your CD through maybe a portable unit but anyhow let's have a look inside this unit um, I originally thought the amplifier was in the in the bottom power unit but it is actually in this one the bottom power unit just has the speaker connectors and the power transformer so we've got two separate SDK amplifier chips SDK 4026s um, I guess a bit of basic Pre-amplifier there, obviously our graphic equaliser and our level meter on the front here. Our uh, input selection and volume control, balance control. So the graphic equaliser doesn't seem to have any chips in or anything. It's just a few transistors and capacitors and discrete components. Uh, along with the slide pots of course. 
Uh, again, yeah, the amplifier doesn't have much in it. A couple of SDK power chips, possibly a little preamp chip there. Uh, a couple of inductors there would, and resistors would probably be our output that goes back through the ribbon cable on the back here. I assume that's marked there somewhere. This left speaker out, right speaker out, yeah, so plus our voltage rails back to the power supply. Uh, I've got a couple of these Sony type heat sinks that they used to have in their VCRs as well, their beta machines. Looks like they've actually sort of shaved the aluminium into these fins. So kind of a bit of a different design that I'm not sure if Sony were the only ones that use them, but the only one I can remember using that style of heat sink instead of the um, extruded uh, section cut off. They actually made these sort of weird shaved versions, shaved out of a block of aluminium, I guess. So, yeah, not much else inside this, just yeah, our earth connector, connection for our record player, two phono inputs, and um, this, actually, it's got a five, yeah, five LED power level meter there. The volume control in this is quite scratchy, so I think we'll pull this front cover off, and um, when I find a screwdriver, we'll never find a Phillips when you need it. No, all gone missing, of course. Can't leave anything lying around this place. We'll have a look because we're going to have to remove the front to try and get access to the front of the slider pot. I oh, didn't really need to take that screw out, I don't think, but anyway. Three screws there and a couple here by the look of it. So I'm not sure they hold the plastic front on. Oh, here's a couple of metal brackets. Go back um, up under it by the look of it. We'll soon find out. It seems to be coming. Oh, there we go. Yeah, quite a bit of dust in there. So our LED board there. You can see a bit more of these little ribbon cables that go between the the graphic equalizer pots. They've actually got LEDs in the end of them too. By the look of it, I can't remember whether they lit up. I think they did actually. Um, yeah, 6.5 millimeter phono auxiliary input. Our balance pot's hidden on the equalizer board there, and our slider volume pot, which has a bit of looks like paper in there and a dead cockroach's body or something. So, <laughs> whoops, well, that fell off, whatever it was. So, that's out of the way. So, give that a bit of a clean out. You can see our slider pot here. So, I need to get some contact cleaner in there. Lots of dust around these graphic equalizer pots it needs to go so I'll give that a clean out while we're at it I think they're all pretty good so I don't know whether they really need some contact cleaner they probably okay condition I guess our balance pot could probably do with a squirt as well give those buttons a bit of a clean up so this is just some little plastic bit I thought was attached but it was only just sitting there and it just sits on the edge by the look of it held on by the screws on the bottom so we don't need that at the moment get some of the old CRC switch cleaner lubricant here and we'll just give that a squirt inside the balance put the nozzle right inside and then just give them a good back and forth just to make sure that cleaner really gets in there and cleans off anything off the contacts off the carbon tracks in there and that should be enough I think to to fix any problems with that normally these sort of Sony better quality pots um, will clean up all right uh, I'll just get some methylated spirits here and I'll just clean clean the edges of those knobs off where they come through because it tends to collect a lot of dirt and our volume knob, much easier to clean them while you've got the front off. And there's the little knob that comes off our graphic equaliser. They're not actually too bad. Yeah, there's an end of the equaliser pot there with a little red LED in it. A little, um, well, it's a bit smaller than the usual 2x5mm square or rectangular. Quite a bit of dust in there too once cleaning out. Uh, better put that plastic bit back in first. Uh, line that up with the 
screw holes. Get those buttons in, make sure all the knobs are coming through. And there we have it. Put all this back together now. Washer there. Not quite sure why, but I could have actually left that in and just slid on it, slid the front panel out by the look of that, but didn't realise that at the time. Put the top screws back in. And we'll hook that up shortly to the amplifier section again, to the power section, sorry again. And see if we get the tuner going and see what the volume pot sounds like on that and the balance pot. But that's our integrated stereo amplifier unit. Now the other thing we have here is our tuner, which is an ST78 Mark II. So we'll have a look inside this. Um, the lamp is actually working in this one. That's one thing that's likely to go wrong with these. So we'll have a look at what sort of lamp it uses. So at least if anyone needs one, they can work out in advance what to order. Uh, it's probably around a 12 volt and a few millimetre diameter from memory. They're all pretty standard in these, but it's been quite a few years since I've seen one. Oh, we've got something attached here. So that's our um, yeah set of LEDs on the front panel here is attached. That probably does unclip somehow. Looks like we squeeze those little bits in there, and there we go. And there's a bit of tape there. But that old, I forget what they call that tape, but fibrous tape. Get rid of all the dust out of that. You know, this old foam, foam bit around the display is all disintegrated. As soon as I brush that, it all falls to bits. So I might as well dispose of that. And yeah, quite a, ooh, a lot of dust in here. She's circuit board's very covered in dust. Oh, same down that side. I guess the vent slots on the top there. Let's let all that in. So I'll just remove all that with a paintbrush. Yeah, very dirty. Nowhere near as bad as a colour TV would be after that many years, but this is where we have it, our LCD display there. Give these a quick clean while I've got the front off. So there's our channel setting buttons. Now this this model doesn't have a preset on it, just has a fast button plus and minus, so you just set your band and go between channels. Which, yeah, a bit odd not having a preset, which was always a useful feature, especially for these higher end units. You'd expect to get that, but I think one of the earlier models or later models of these did have five preset buttons along there. But this one certainly doesn't, so we've got a big band switch in here, AM ferrite rod there, basically your AM antenna. Well, that's probably our FM front end, because here yeah, that's after the. And we've got a short wave and medium wave antenna connection ground. FM, also what's left of a telescopic antenna here for FM, which looks to come through, yeah, through that yellow wire there. So we've got some, um, looks like Sanyo chips in here, LA1245, LA3390 and an A, which might be short for LA anyway, 1231. Uh, voltage regulator, I would guess, on that heatsink. A couple of electrodes next to us and transistors, so you're quite likely some sort of voltage regulator. This would probably run on, get one of the um, amplifier type voltages up here and then drop that down to 12 volts or the like. Um, yeah, some sort of front end there, some IF and lots of little trim caps here. These yellow ceramic filters. Uh, there's a potentiometer there separation adjustment uh, 
VCO check test point. Looks like some sort of LPF low pass filters, VCO adjustment, tuner level adjustment, slow level adjustment, slow. Mm. No idea what that is. Tune level adjustment. And you'd need the service manual to work out the rest are, but you shouldn't have to touch any of that stuff. This almost looks like some sort of stereo circuit here. Two pots, matched capacitors and transistors, but not too sure what that is. Uh, and you've got a lamp mounted on the back here. Ooh, let me pull the whole unit off. So there's a, it looks like a sort of postage stamp LSI chip under here. Surface mount one. You can see it. It's the old school one where they've cut a hole in the circuit board for the chip and then soldered it on from underneath. So I'll poke that back in. This bit should just lift up. And we should be able to push this lamp circuit board out. So there we have it. PL501 small incandescent lamp. I'd say that's about a five millimeter. It's got one of these little rubber, yellow rubber little condoms as some people call them on there. So it's got the little stick-on bit which will sometimes these are pretty badly deteriorated. This one doesn't really want to come off so I won't mess with it too much but you should be able to basically slide that off if you ever need to replace one of these. Uh, yeah, the board's looking like it's had a fair bit of heat on there as is usual with incandescent lamps. So oh, was it the other way around? Oh, I think that was the way it went. Have to bend that slightly to get it out. Oh, there we go. Get that in there. Clip that back in. We'll have a look at the voltage on that. But it's about five millimeter, so four or five millimeter should do the job. Uh, what else we got here? It looks like we've actually moved some of this dust. Actually got a battery cover here, which is odd. Oh yeah. So we've got a couple of old. Batteries, actual genuine Sony ones. Jeez, I bet they've been in there a long time. They're probably not in too good a condition. Ooh, yeah, that one's rotted out on the end. I don't know if they've been in there since the 80s, but it's possible. Not sure if that's a date or something, but two something in Japanese characters by the look of it. Distributed by Sony Everetti Incorporated, made in Japan. Now why it actually has those in there, I'm not sure, because we don't have any presets here. Uh, we've also got an AM channel space, 9 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, depending what country you're in. There's a little switch down in there we can change. But uh, yeah, we'll get rid of those batteries, they're not much good. Um, actually, I guess it's probably just so whatever... Yeah, that would be all it is. It would just be a, it would be a memory backup, but it's probably just whatever. If you tune this to a hundred point nine or something, is your favourite uh, radio station to listen to. And the last thing you listen to, if you turn the unit off, it would need battery backup, no doubt, to to save that station when you turn it back on again. That would be my only guess. Or if you unplug the unit because it is sort of semi-portable and move it to another room or something, uh, that must be the battery backup, just so that it comes back on whatever station you had, rather than resetting back to. 87.8 or whatever the minimum uh, frequency is on the band, which is probably what it normally goes back to. And I think that's what this one came on, because I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure they, they're well and truly flat, given the amount of corrosion on that. So otherwise it would just reset back to the lowest frequencies where they usually start. So they must have a couple of these in here, just so that you, even though it doesn't have preset stations, it's just to, to save whatever station you were last on. Which is kind of interesting, but... Yeah, I wasn't expecting any sort of battery backup, but that would make sense because these older chips wouldn't have had any sort of flash type memory in them back in those days. Um, they just had a chip that, as soon as the power was off, some of these Sony tuners used to have a little, um, uh, what do you call them? I forget what they're even called, like the, the flat cell battery, watch type battery with a couple of solder connectors on them. They weren't lithium, I don't think. I forget what they actually were. It's been so long since I looked at one, but they used to have that type of battery soldered to the board somewhere. A lot of those sort of hi-fi component ones have that. But all that used to go wrong with them was either the lamp would blow or the battery memory battery would fail in them. It's just a three-volt one. 
and you'd have to unsolder that and replace it. You used to be able to buy the ones with the tags already attached so you could solder it to the circuit board because supposedly if you solder directly to those batteries and you're not really quick they will can explode. So we'll plug the tuner into our unit here, main amp unit and turn the power on might help. Well now I don't have a lamp so maybe that globe has finally packed it in with me messing around with it. Uh, I don't think the other connector matters. It might do. Where does the other connector go? That goes into our... I'll just plug our amplifier unit in. Just to make sure we haven't lost the rail here. Nope. Although we don't seem to... Uh, better plug that in, I guess. Let's see. Uh, where are we? I like a... Uh, I've got the wrong connector here anyway, but look at that's ST78. Oh no, that is the tuner. TA, that must be the tape deck. Oh, there it is. So another connector there for the amplifier module. Now we've got power on the amp. Yep, graphic equalizer lit up, but yeah, it looks like me fiddling with this lamp has that caused it to blow. But we can still have a look at the multimeter and see uh, what voltage is on that. Okay, I've got my fluke here, but it's set to DC volts. So I'll get onto the connector on the back of this white globe. The two pins of the actual globe. And this little circuit board, and yeah, we have 12 volts. Negative 12 volts because I'm the wrong way around, but 12 volts nonetheless. So it's a 12 volt light globe. And yeah, not surprisingly, just me fiddling with it was enough. Now I can't seem to make a connection to that. There we go. Yeah, so we've got 12 volts. So that's a 12 volt globe. So it looks like now that now I've messed with it, it's actually blown. So we're going to have to repair that unless one of these wires has come off or something. No, they seem to be connected. So we'll see if we can get this little rubber cover off. Yeah, it's starting to come off. Sometimes the heat's actually destroyed these. And you've got to be careful you don't rip them. So there's our little rubber bit. And yeah, we've just got one of these little grain of wheat type globes. So I should have some of these somewhere, but whether I can find them in a hurry is another thing. Here we go. Luckily I ordered a heap of these off eBay. I think they're about the only size of globe you can still get. This one's a little tad small actually. Yeah, it's more like a two or three millimeter, which is annoying. So that's not gonna hold that on there. So I may have to glue that on. I'll just check what other globes I've got. I've got yeah, I've got one on my old ones from my old repair shop days. And that's a 12 volt, and that's about the same size. Looks like about a five millimeter, four or five. Perfect. That's just a perfect replacement there. Much easier when they're the same size because you can just slide this little rubber cover on, and it actually stays on the globe. So just a matter of unsoldering the old one. And I think we'll... Does that open up the holes? No. We'll just need the solder socket to remove that. Make it easier to insert the new one. You could just cut the leads to the right length and bend them right and that would probably do the job as well, but you could poke them through while melting the solder. 
but we'll get that in there. Try and bend it roughly the same as the original. Making sure there's a decent gap. There's not a lot of gap there, but they're very close together on the globe itself. But make sure your leads can't short out. And then we'll solder that on. Perfect. Yeah, all good. Uh, cut the pigtails off of the pair of side cutters, making sure you hold onto them or just make sure they go on the floor or somewhere and not inside the tuna. So I'll reinsert this board. And turn that back on and we have light again, so. So basically that orangey colour you get on the display, that's from that yellow rubber coating. Whether it should be a bit more yellow than that, I don't know, but it's doing the job. Um, so I'll turn the power back off on that. Now I can put the cover back on. Clip our LED board back in. Now... Yeah, I think the red one was at the top here with the cables at the bottom, so that makes sense. Oh, not much length on this. In you go. Yeah, bit of a fiddly design, that. Oh, yeah, the bottom one's just a clip. And the top one's a double clip thing. Oh, yeah, that's it. Probably should poke that back under that tape. Even though it's not going to do a lot now. So it roughly stays in place. And yeah, good chance to also clean out the holes here. Round our switches, because very hard to get those clean with the switches in place. Uh, always place to give the tuner a bit of a clean up as you go. If you're going to be using it for anything again on selling it or anything like that antennas in the way there let's try and get those buttons lined up yeah why doesn't that want to go back together probably a oh, yeah. there it goes okay I'll just remove make sure I don't need to screw this back together And we'll give the um, hook the speakers up and just check that volume control out. Another thing you can do is you tend to get a bit of dust in these screw holes, so while well, the screw's out, it's another, another thing that wants cleaning. Makes the unit look a lot better without all those little bits of dust. Okay, so all our connectors are in. speakers and can't reconnect them or connect one of them. Oh, I'll better connect both because we want to hear what both channels are like with the volume control. Put the other one over there. Scratching us there, but that doesn't mean too much. Give it to tuna. Oh, that's... Now on tape, we're getting a little bit of hum because we're not plugged in, but no scratching us at all now. So that's a good sign. Same with photo, we're picking up a bit of rubbish since the sockets are just open, not grounded. Well, we've lost the channel here. Okay, let's back again. Let's 
the wires there, probably on the back of the speaker. One channel, other channel. Just check each equaliser pot here. Make sure there's no scratchiness in those. Probably hardly been used in its life, so they should be all right. So yeah, our pots are pots are all good. Put up the antenna here. I did have a channel here somewhere. Tuned, we're in stereo. So yes, I assume if we are on 87.8, if we turn this off, and turn it back on again, yeah, we go back to 87.5. So without batteries in there, was it 87.8? Blew the front off the speaker. Well, the dust cap was a bit loose on this, it just flew off, so we'll have a look at that in a minute. Got a couple of slightly newer batteries. If we put those in there, I think the contacts are still alright at least. They both seem to face the same direction, which is not the usual way of doing it. Of course, the cover doesn't want to go on. Okay, so we're on 87.8. Turn it off there. Turn it off for the PowerPoint just to make sure. And we're still on 87.8, so yeah, those batteries are definitely just to store that memory setting, even though it doesn't have presets. So yep, that's all gone. Bit of noise there on shortwave. Probably should have given that switch a clean, actually, now that I think of it. That might be normal to be a little scratchy anyway. No idea what frequency we have any AM on. I think there used to be one around 700 and something. No idea, there used to be one on 1080 I think. Not sure if that still exists. Three six was it? Mm, something vaguely there. Doesn't seem to pick up real well on AM. Been a long time since I've listened to it, so there's a station there, but Probably needs an external antenna. Ooh, yeah, that's very scratchy. This. So I think we're going to have to remove the cover again. Remove the power first. And try and find what I did with that screwdriver. Probably should get my drill to do this, but anyway, that's only a few screws. <laughs> okay, so I'll slide this forward again. Got nice easy access to the top of the switch here. Give a good taste of switch cleaner lubricant in there. Might as well turn it back on and have a listen. Turn up the volume a little bit. 
Yeah, it's a lot better. So I'll give that a few turns just to work that switch cleaner lubricant through it, but that switch was noisy as well, so now it's not making any noise. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fixed our AM. <laughs> That's the same channel again on the AM, but we've actually got reception now, so... So that's probably why when I was tapping it... When I was tapping it, it was a bit scratchy and stuff, but the, and the AM was really quiet. Well, let's fix it. Cleaning the contacts in that switch, obviously something wasn't... Something wasn't clicking in properly. Yeah, well there is still something on 1080, the horse racing. So that old channel used to be 7HT I think it was. And this is 7ZR from memory. Yeah, there's much point going through the shortwave bands. I'm not sure if there's much on there anymore. And FM, so that's much better. So we've got a new light globe in there. And we've also got the AM working again. Got rid of the scratchiness out of the switch. So that's probably as good as new again. If I can get the cover back on. Go on in you go. That's it. Shame about the marks on the top. But it looks like something's actually eaten into the plastic there. Well, actually probably eaten this. I think they this metallic finish is actually sprayed on. It's a spray paint type finish. So once that's got damaged, there's not a lot you can do with it. But um, as long as it's working electrically, I'm happy with that. Front panel looks good on it. But unfortunately, you do see this as part of the top of the unit, so it's a bit of a shame it's not the best condition. Okay, so the next thing we'll have a look at is I've actually got the tape deck pulled apart. So we'll have a look inside that. Disconnect the speakers again. And we'll get rid of that unit. Actually, we'll have a look at the speaker while I'm at it. Now, this speaker's actually got the grill broken off it. And, yeah, the tweeter's been out in the sun because of the missing grill, and the cone's pretty much detached around the edge. And uh, this square woofer here, honeycomb square woofer, that's actually just lost its dust cover. That was starting to peel off. Now it's actually popped right off. So it might be a good chance to have a look at one of these. These are still got a round voice coil in them, but I can see a sort of aluminium piece coming up from that. And then we've got this honeycomb type arrangement on the front, and they're quite a good sounding speaker, but yeah, completely different to the old paper cone like the tweeter here, which is a round voice coil. And obviously that just moves this paper cone up and down, which has flexible edges on it. And um, obviously this, this has a flexible edge too, the foam around the edge. Obviously a good quality one too, because it hasn't fallen to bits like a lot of speakers from this era. I mean, sometimes it can be a good environment, but I don't think these Sony ones tend to go. They're actually some sort of synthetic foam or something, and yeah, a lot better. I'll remove the connectors there. So it's just got a, a bipolar cap in series with a tweeter, and I think, yeah, that's it. No other crossover. So I've got a bit of a gasket on the back here. It's a Sony 070A002. Impedance 6 ohms, 38 watt max, made in Japan of course. And yeah, if you see, so the bottom part around the voice coil has got the usual little flexible bit in there, a couple of flexible wires feeding it. And then it looks like it's got an aluminium former, which is what our voice coil obviously insulated and then wrapped around. Although it is insulated wire anyway. But then we've got this strange aluminium back piece here. It's like a aluminium cone with a couple of holes in it, which you can just possibly see down through there. 
So I've got a voice coil, it looks like it's glued with epoxy or something like that to this other aluminium piece. The aluminium piece is glued to the back of, you can just see the edge of, looks like an aluminium coated, the whole thing's aluminium, I think, aluminium honeycomb. So it's two sheets, an outer and inner sheet of flat aluminium. And it looks to be the inner part of it, the honeycomb part is aluminium at 90 degrees to it, put in a honeycomb pattern. It's a bit of glue around the edges. And that's all there is to it, really. It's a different design. The magnet form in there's got a sort of uh, convex bit in that. Depression in it, but yeah, it's it's actually a very rigid speaker cone. So I guess its job really is just like any speaker cone, just to vibrate the air to push it backwards and forwards. But this is a very rigid design. It's just got the yeah foam surround, like I said, which is a little bit bent on that corner. And yeah, it's just a, a very rigid aluminium voice coil former glued to an aluminium cone glued to a solid, or fairly, you know, it's honeycomb, it's hollow, but it's it's stiff. And that's the front, and this is merely just a little dust cover to go over, stop anything getting down in there, because you don't want anything getting in between your, your magnet former and your voice coil, because that'll just grate in there between the two, and stop it moving properly. And that's about all there is to it. Oh yeah, this should be actually the other way. Someone's poked that in. So, at great risk, I'll push that back out again. That was inverted, basically. Some, like usual, some kid or something's got there and poked their finger into that, as they can't resist. Or it might have just, when they dropped it and broke the grill or whatever they'd done, that might have poked it in. So that should be bent outwards, like that. A little foam piece on the back which is probably just to dampen it or something so it doesn't vibrate itself but yeah just a bit of glue will hold that back on and we've got a good woofer again well slightly bent dust cover on it but that's what's inside one of those sony honeycomb flat square square woofers i think they did have a particular name for these things there's no uh Oh, it might be this APM thing on this other one. I forget, I'll have to look it up what it stood for, but I think that APM stands for some strange term they used for it. Black back on our negative terminal. Red on our positive. And I don't think it matters which way it goes in the box. But that's basically how these flat square woofers are set up in these Sony's. I get a feeling other manufacturers did put them out, but I can't actually remember. I have a feeling Sharp might have had a unit with some sort of flat square woofer in it at some stage. And I think Sony had like a three-way speaker, the tweeter, mid and woofer were all... It was for like a bigger component system or something, but they were all these honeycomb flat square things. Um, but the only other thing of interest in this is we've got our bracket to mounted onto the unit got our speaker connector looks like there's actually a bracket to put a screw on a wall and hang it on that um, before connecting check the amplifier is off continuous power input must not exceed the nominal power handling capacity powerful magnets inside so keep away from recorded tapes watches credit cards using magnetic coating and tv sets because yeah that was always a problem people putting speakers next to their crt tv would um, at least magnetise the the shadow mask and if you left it there or had it too close you could actually bend it permanently and there's no way you could degauss it after that but um, yeah I have to look at that I'm pretty sure APM stands for something so no, APM 078 38 watts nominal 76 max so obviously if you hook this up to the Sony unit unless you really turn it up in a clipping you shouldn't be able to damage these off that the amplifier should be this, the correct power rating for these. And um, yeah, that's about it for the speaker.